Okay. All right. Cool. Hello, it's another Loose Heads podcast in association with Talking Rugby Union. I'm Chris Hill. I hope wherever you're listening, you're keeping well and safe during this lockdown period. It's been a brilliant few weeks on the Loose Heads podcast in terms of the guests we've had on. We had Sean Edwards to our most recent guest, Dane Coles, ahead of the new Super Rugby season. And the three men behind this operation, which get these guests on and everything to do with Loose Heads, is of course the co-founders, Mark Shotton, Rob Shotton and Dave Nickel. Guys, welcome once again. How are we all? Very well, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Excellent, excellent. And to have those few names feature on Talking Rugby Union as well has been a real, real bonus for us during, during this lockdown period. So I can't thank the guys at Loose Heads enough for helping us out with that. And I think our next guest probably falls under the bracket of the big names that we've had recently because I'm delighted to say Bristol Bears Director of Rugby, Pat Lamb, joins us on the podcast this afternoon. Pat, thank you so much for giving us your time. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Uh, and I think you've probably been asked this a number of times, part in, the, in a couple of the media things you've been doing uh, during the lockdown period. But how, how are you during this? How have you been, sorry, during this period? How's things? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like a game. You've got to take every, every minute as it comes, every day as it comes. I mean, if you told us right at the very beginning, all right, you're going to be down for 10, 11 weeks, and then we'll see you then. You know, that, that could have been difficult. So it's about going day to day and looking like anything and challenges in life. You know, you, you face the challenge and you, you, you make your plan and, and, and how you're going to get through it. And, um, and then you focus on the positive and the important things. Um, and so, you know, certainly um, being able to have the quality family time, which bonus family time, because we do get quality time, but this is all bonus time, which has been awesome. And, you know, there's, there's six of us here at the moment, um, me, my wife and four of the five children. And we've had four birthdays in lockdown as well, which has been different, you know. So <laughs> my my next my daughter's the next one's in the uh, beginning of July. So I think after the last one, we're all saying, well, let's hope that we can be out of lockdown by the time we have that, her birthday. So no, there's some great stuff. And the, and the other real bonus is, you know, when you're in Super Rugby, yeah, you always get about four or five months of preparation to go into, in between seasons. Uh, Northern Hemisphere Rugby, it's, you know, four weeks and then you're back into it again. So a really good chance to uh, reflect, review and um, and prepare and uh, take us hopefully to another level. So it's been good times. Yeah, and it's quite key that you mentioned family there, Pat, because I guess when rugby went into lockdown, everyone was talking about, well, when's it going to return? But I know you did an interview and you talked about how important family and connecting was during this period of time. And I know you were very conscious to make sure that your family over in New Zealand was doing okay, as well as your family here in the UK as well. So how important was it for you to, first and foremost, focus on that part of your life before anything would be related came into it? I think it's important for anything. So when I go back to the, the thing about what asking the question, that we're all forced to ask, well, what is, you know, when you enter a lockdown, what are the most important things? So, and we, we acknowledge it all the time and um, around staying connected, uh, you know, um, either as a team, but certainly to the people that's important to you and whether that's your, your wife, your partner, your children, um, mums and dads, you know, we, we try to make them a big part of the club as well because it's an important part of who we are. And if you don't, you know, you're, you're missing out on really growing the, the player or the individual or the staff member to the best of their ability. So um, it's, a, it's a big part. So I think... What the you're generally building your team culture and everything for the performance on the field, you know that ultimately when you're in those tough moments and and they are it's physically tough to play the game and and you're coming together as a group trying to work and 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 obviously win games and perform to your best. But um, what the pandemic has done is is put the emphasis on um, there is no game, but it put our culture into a really good spotlight. That so when we doing things and connecting it's what we normally do every day anyway and it's coming real handy um you know through this time to be able to support each other and you know the boys have done a lot of uh, a lot of great work the staff have done a lot of great work not only in the community but certainly um staying connected and, and keeping an eye on each other and you mentioned sort of the community aspects of, of, of the lads there part and i've known i know you've said in the past that it's all about leaving nobody behind. And I guess right now during this pandemic that we had, that mental health is an issue which is talked about more and more. And I know when you were over in Ireland, 
you spoke really candidly about it and he said it's okay not to be okay and it is very important to create, create a rugby environment which mirrors real life as well so I guess that connection with, within the team and within you guys is, is also helping the mental health aspects as well. You know without a doubt I mean I um, when, when I got involved there my message was also slightly different and that a lot of the messages that were coming out was was exactly that that telling the person who's suffering from mental health that it's not okay to be it's okay to be okay not okay sorry and and that to seek help but what i wanted to give a message was let's look out for people let's look out for people who need help you know because not everyone has mental health uh, goes through it you know, it's, you know some are very blessed and fortunate not to but there's a there's a lot who do and it's like anything, and the part of the building relationships and, and connecting is it's, it's not just for when good times and, and having a you know, laugh and so forth. It's so that people can generally discern that someone's not right, can ask the question, are you okay, and, and be there. And I think if you talk to most people who've come through mental health, the most important thing was that they, um, they found hope, um, they found um, support. Uh, so the message I would really wanted to give out there was to to everybody, uh, whether you have mental health or you don't, look out for each other, and, and that's what we do in the team anyway. Absolutely, Pat. Couldn't agree with you uh, more on that. And in terms of the player side of things, obviously there's a lot of emphasis on fitness and stuff at the moment with the season hopefully resuming soon, Pat. But what uh, Rob mentioned to me before we start the podcast that you've set up a survival plan for the Bristol Bears. I mean, what, what has that entailed over the last uh, few weeks or so? Yeah, well, it started off, uh, I named it a survival plan. That lasted about 10 seconds. And I said, actually, no, I don't <laughs> like that. I, I wanted a Bears, uh, it was the Bears coronavirus winning plan. Um, you know, how to win. And, um, you know, so um, now it was, again, um, the quality of the staff. I put a challenge to them when we got a, an inkling that we might go into lockdown and we were supposed to, we were on a quick short break because we had beaten Harlequins on the Sunday. We had uh, gave them the rest of the week off and we we're coming back to ready to play Saracens. And we were supposed to be 8.30 in the morning like we do, you know, have a full um, team meeting, everyone, all staff, all players. And we start the week every morning at 8.30 with, uh, you know, key messages and, and, you know, hopefully an inspiring message as well. But I, uh, I sent a message out on... Um, to all the staff that uh, the heads department, if we go into lockdown here, the different scenarios, I want you to think of your department and how would you be able to, um, what are some key things to be able to tick off, um, whether we're down as um, modified, uh, we can come in in small groups or whether we're at home or whether we're actually completely locked down and can't go anywhere. Um, and they did all that. We had a meeting at uh, seven o'clock that morning on Monday. I asked all the rest of the, everyone else not to come in until one o'clock. And we thrashed it out to two and a half, maybe three hours. Everyone contributed and we formulated the plan. We asked every single question on how would we do this? What about the guys who live here? The ones on their own? How are we going to get equipment to them? How are we going to do this? So, and it was awesome. I just asked the questions, the staff provided it all. And then we brought everyone at one o'clock and we rolled it all out. Very similar to what the government do. Hopefully we're doing a bit of a better job. We go, um, here's level one, two, three, all the ones. And then this is what's going to happen. And it's like anything in life and, and business and, and sport, but having clarity on what the big picture is, you know, gives everyone uh, comfort, gives everyone uh, security. And then, um, and then we, uh, we rolled it out and it's just worked the treat. So when certain things happen, we were told we're doing this, bang, everyone knew exactly what the plan was and they can, you know, initiate it. And then I had staff meetings nine o'clock every Monday so we can stay connected and then player meetings as well. So, you know, and, and that's been good. And, and the boys have set up little groups and we've set out different challenges. S&C done well. The coaches have done schoolwork. Medical guys said rehab, prehab. They've still come in with PPE equipment and so forth and had treatment. So it's been great. It's been really, really pre pleased and uh, just, you know, really confirmed to me that we've got great people that work for the Bristol Bears. Something else you've kind of been discussing around, uh, you know, during lockdown um, as a bit of an inspiration for the team is the Last Dance documentary on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, like, it, it's impossible to watch that and not be inspired by Jordan and those Bulls teams. 
but is there anything specific you kind of took from that documentary that you think could be applied to bears? Oh, there's a lot there that I think, you know, I think with lockdown, everyone's watching more TV and documentaries and different things. And I couldn't have picked a better one to be on there because that certainly was through my playing era, my playing era in the nineties. Um, and so you could, you know, uh, relate to a lot of what was going on because you know often you know we're talking now 30 years ago um, and often um, you know 20 to 30 years and and people talk to how players are different now you know society's different now the young people are different now and so the good thing like like in our day you might know, either you know toughen up harden up or, or, or move on you know and you, and you actually got pretty you got resilience you know people will talk to you in a certain way but that was just the way things were done now not I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Um, it was just the way it was. And, you know, to see players go, geez, Michael Jordan was so focused on being the best and, and not the big message, not asking anyone to do anything that he wasn't going to do. And yes, there was guys that said he wasn't a nice guy and so forth. But at the end of the day, there were so many guys that achieved a lot of things because he, he raised the standards, you know, and you can debate whether he did it one way. But at the end, end of the day... It's like anything. I'm still a big believer. I remember at school, right from a young age, we got taught about goal setting, set a goal and work your way to it. And it actually becomes for some people, oh, you heard that, heard that before. But mate, you can hear it. It's, it's going to be here forever. It's simple. It's, it's an easy philosophy. Here's the goal. What's the plan? And start working your way to it. And understanding that, yeah, he had some talent, but it's not the talent he had. It's, we all got some talent. It's what you do with that talent that determines, you know, how good or how great you're going to be and how committed you are to it. Um, and uh, so there were so many positive analogies for us as a team that our players and our staff could resonate with. And um, um, and, and and some of them actually said, yeah, you know, we, we have it pretty easy, you know, in, in, in our life. And, you know, uh, um, because there, there is times, and I know Jordan Crane was big on it, you know, he came through that era too, that... You know, sometimes he used to get frustrated and um, you know, just get on with it. Um, you know, and if you've got a problem, say, tell the guys he's got a problem and make them deal with it. But, you know, he's grown as well to realise there is, you know, people are different. But the philosophy and the aim is trying to, what they're trying to achieve is the same. Yeah. And you kind of touch on it there, but obviously kind of Jordan had that mentality of win at all costs even though it kind of resulted in bust-ups with teammates, whether verbally or, you know, kind of with Steve Kerr in the physical way. Do you think it's possible to kind of dovetail that sort of win-at-all-cost mentality with a really strong team culture, particularly in a sport like rugby? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, that's why my number one emphasis I put on everything is relationships. Build your relationships. Because yeah, if you put it into the war analogy and going into war, um, you 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 gotta. I always look at rugby very similar in the sense. To to go to war, you need to know what you're fighting for. You need to know who you represent, and then most importantly, I've got to be able to trust the guy next to me and the guy next to me. When a call is made, and I don't, and I don't trust that call, I'm that second guessing myself, and the next thing, myself and others around us could get killed. And it's exactly the same in the game. So when I talk about trying to accelerate relationships and get to know each other, it's because not just in the great times, but it's the times you're under pressure. When you're under pressure, you want to be able to um, say exactly what you need to say um, because you, you're creating it and what you're saying, you're creating a culture that what we say is to help the team. I'm not, don't take it personally. I'm just saying it to make the team and challenge it. But you've got to build those relationships. So the way I talk to some of the players now across the line and what I expect of the staff is completely different from my first two, three months with them, you know, because I didn't have a relationship. It's like you guys. I'm just meeting a lot of you for the first time today. You know, I couldn't say certain things to you guys because I don't know you. But, you know, I always talk about, you know, uh, me and my wife. Now, my wife is beautiful, like as in a beautiful person. And she... Um, the way she, everyone loves her because she's got a great smile and she cares for people and she's she's really good communicator with people. They have never ever, I don't think anyone's seen the way she is when she talks to me. <laughs> if, she, if I've done something wrong, you know. But I but I but I see that as a privilege. 
I see that as a privilege that she can be straight up and honest and tell me how she feels. I'm, I feel like I'm the chosen one for that because me and her have this relationship that she can say that and I know she's not being pissed. So I realize that you know, I've upset her, I've done something wrong, so we've got to talk through it. It's like when players or people that are young people say to me, oh, yeah, me and my girlfriend, we never argue. I said, no, it's not that you're not arguing, you're not talking, you're mm-hmm. not communicating, you know? Um, and so I do like conflict and challenge because then if it's done the right way, because at the end of it, you can get some change and you can get some growth. You know, if everyone's, if nothing, if everything's not been said, you just stay the same with anything, you go backwards. So when you highlight all of this stuff at the very beginning, and I, I give everyone my coaching philosophy, which touches on that. Um, I give everyone um, the big picture and I put out a lot of different philosophies. You would have heard me talk about their vision drives leadership, leadership drives culture, culture drives performance. And that's what creates the legacy. You know, and all these other different philosophies I roll out at the very beginning. But now the people who are in our environment know, oh, that's, we're living that. They, they can see that, you know. I mean, I had to make some tough calls of players um, and staff that are leaving. And uh, it's the worst part of my job. But at the very beginning, I always talk about relationships being very important and performance being really important, you know, particularly in the work that we're in. But I don't mix the two of them in the sense that, I could be really good friends of you, but ultimately your currency while you're in the Bristol Bears is your performance, whether you're a physio, a doctor, uh, S&C or a rugby player, you know, because exactly what him, you know, I could be come across as a really nice guy, but if we don't perform or I don't perform, I lose my job. Everyone does that. So it's all about supporting your performance. Um, so I've had to let some really good people go. And, and a lot of it would be with a, you know, it's on performance or someone else can do the um, do the job better or the same, um, you know, within a budget. So those are all the different decisions. But you put those philosophies out there, and then everyone can relate to it. Absolutely, Pat. I mean, just to bring you in, Rob. Obviously, you've been working with the Bristol Bears for a year and a half, if if that's right in saying. And before we go into sort of what Pat's just discussed there about sort of the the team culture, he he spoke so candidly and so well about mental health at the top of the podcast. And I mean, you said before we got Pat on that he's such a massive believer in mental health. So it must be really pleasing that you are, first of all, we got Pat on, but second of all, you're, you're working with someone who is so passionate about mental health awareness as, as you are as well. Yeah, it's brilliant to have Pat on. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure to be down at the training ground and speak to Pat and he's one of the most inspiring blokes I've ever met. But just to come on to, uh, you know, Brist- Bristol Bears and, and a question for you, Pat. You know, you've been quoted on saying that if you want me to coach rugby, you've got the wrong guy. Um, I've spoken to you before a couple of times about how you joined Bristol and that there were other clubs in for you. Um, but there was something about Bristol and there was something about Steve Lansdowne's philosophy to inspire the community through rugby success. Can you just explain that initial conversation with Steve and just how important was that vision to you? Yeah, it was massively important because... Um, I um, I went from a, a, a an enjoyable playing career and transitioned straight into coaching. So Ian McGeekin took me into Scotland, mentored me, was fantastic. And then I ended up coaching Auckland, the provincial team, and we had good success. Um, had to interview for all of these roles. And then I ended up um, going to the Blues. Um, no interview, just super rugby, great job, young coach. You know, salary goes up, just took it. Yeah, fantastic. And then got into the role and started going. Then I started looking sideways at what's happening. Don't worry about that. You just coach rugby. You'll be right. But all the things that were going on around the place, the periphery was affecting what was happening here. But the, and and who, who gets judged on everything and uh, what we do on the field and what I've been affected by here and things that there was just no clarity whatsoever. So I came away from that experience. I did five years there. Um, and at the end of it, I came away and said, right. And I got sacked. I said, right. The next job I go, I'm never, ever going to do another job for anybody unless I have absolute clarity on what their vision is because of the, the equation I gave before. And making sure, because I knew what my coaching vision was, I know what my coaching philosophy is, my mission statement, and it has to marry and go together. If it doesn't, the same thing's going to happen, the situation I found myself in. So, um, and so the same thing when I went to Connick, um, I, it was five different options. Connick, when I, on, when I, my agent told me there's five, you've got to meet them all. And Connick was number one before, I, uh, five was number five before I met, after I met everyone, it changed to number one because of the vision. 
and then when Bristol, um, after we won the Pro 12, there was a, quite a few offers of people wanting me to, to, to come to their club. And at the stage, I was very happy with, um, with uh, Connick that didn't want to leave. Family loved it in the West of Ireland. And then um, I got a, in the space of two, there was two premiership clubs. Um, one uh, I met first and then the second, no, I met Bristol first. So um, I came over first to meet Chris Boy, John Lansdowne. Um, and basically they went through it all and asked them and so forth around the vision and and, um, and then got a chance to talk about where what, what I'll do and so forth. And but I was pretty much come away from there thinking, well, it, it's okay. And then Steve flew over uh, with, uh, with his wife, with Maggie. They came over to the west of Ireland and we spent four hours uh, with Steph and, 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 the, and, and the two of them. And I said to him, Steve, what is your vision? And he started to talk about, obviously we need some success on the rugby field, without a doubt. But he started to talk about Bristol, the people, the city, and you could just see the passion he had about it, you know. And then he, I said, oh, yeah, but you're a football man. And he says, because you obviously did my homework and you coach football. Uh, he owns a football club. He goes, I am, but I'm a sport person. I know the impact that sport ha has on galvanising and bringing together a community. And the, the rugby community within Bristol um, has suffered a long time. And he says that, it's uh, you know, we need some inspiration and da-da-da. So... I went away from that and I said, geez, I like that. And, and the reason I liked that is because it was more than a game. He wasn't just talking about rugby. And I knew, and it's come to play now, where we are now, where the reason Steve is very supportive of what we're doing is we've built trust. And the club has become the club exactly the way that he saw it. You know, that's what we've been able to do, all the people, all the players. To, and I went away and I just put, said to Steve and Chris, because Chris, Chris Boy gave a very similar um, um, statement around the vision. And, but I put it, a vision has to be known by everybody. So it has to be one statement. So all I did was write down, inspire our community for rugby success. I said to Steve, is this it? He goes, is this what you mean? He goes, yes. And Chris, yes. So then I was able to come in. And interesting, I knew the answer. I took all the staff away. I took all the players away on a different day. And I said, right, I want everyone to write on their books what you think the Bristol Rugby vision is. They all wrote it down. Not one single person had the same thing. So I uh, had the one that was written by Steve. And no one, there's seven different answers. And so all I said when I rolled it out, inspire our community for rugby success, I said, does that encapsulate what you have on your books? Or... 45 staff or 50 odd players said yes. So now we were in one bus. Now we we're going through one door instead of seven different doors. Because as I said, before I arrived there, there's a lot of good people working in Bristol rugby. However, they're all doing their own different things. You know, nothing was together. So the leaders were making decisions on all over the place, which made necessary. There's nothing, no destination, a bus going around in circles. And, um, and all, that's all we did. It started with that. Um, and I think the thing that I've loved the most is, um, for me, um, one of the reasons I said, if you want just rugby coach, you got the wrong guy, because I've been very blessed to be in very successful teams, but I've also been very blessed and fortunate to be in some rubbish teams, some <laughs> great teams. And the good thing when I stand back, there's three non-negotiables. You've got to have a game that can win and beat any team in the world. Now, I'm not talking about just players. I'm talking about the game. I believe my game could beat anybody, but I need the players to come up and be upskilled to play it. So I'll never bring the game down to the players. They've got to come up, which means I need good staff to coach the players to play the game that we need to play. The second thing is um, you've got to have a really good culture. And if the culture's not right, you know, you can have a fantastic game, but people aren't enjoying being there. Likewise, you can have a great culture, but you've got a game that they can't win. You'll leave semifinals, playoffs, you'll have a good season, but you might stay in the premiership all the time, but you won't win it. And then the third one is that you've got to have leaders. Um, it's around leadership. If you do not bring leaders and power the people behind you, you might win it once, but you'll never win it again. You know, you've got to make sure that the whole philosophy that we have within the group, that when you come into Bristol Bears, you do everything. You, you pick up, understand what's gone before, add value to it and leave it in a better place, pass it on to the next person, make sure you're educating and teaching the people around the Bristol way, the way we do things, the way we respect each other, our community, a whole lot, and then it becomes a sustainable thing. So that's why I said to Steve, 
Do you want me to come? I need to look after those three areas. And because the issue I had, it's all very well to have a team culture, but we don't have an organization culture. We've got problems. So everyone in the Bears organization has to be following the same sort of vision, um, values, and standards and be accountable to it. Absolutely, Pat. I think that probably answers the next point that I've got uh, that we were thinking of in terms of you also said that being a Bristol Bear is more than just a rugby. So I guess that encapsulates everything you just said there but in terms of some of the changes that you, you enforced when you first came in I know there's a lot of things around handshakes and stuff like that but is it those like small and fine details which help the bigger picture that you've just been talking about? Yeah without well, a doubt I mean I think um, I did a um, you know a analogy um, when I first got in with all the staff I actually put 50 pound out I did an exercise sorry and I bought a my kids thousand piece puzzle and basically I um, I gave everyone uh, an opportunity, uh, sorry, five people an opportunity to win the 50 pound. They had to come up, grab one piece, look at it, and they had 10 seconds to try and tell me what the, um, what the uh, picture was. And if they could, they'd take the 50 pound. And they were looking at it, looking at it. No, no, no one could, they had a guess, but no one could get it. And then I ripped the paper off the cover and I said, you won't be able to complete this thousand piece puzzle unless you know what the picture, the big picture looks like, which is all about the vision. And I said, but the other side of it too, it emphasizes how important every person's role is. Because I said, if you take one piece out, you've done a puzzle of 999 pieces. If that one in the middle is missing, it's not, there's something wrong with it. Um, and which emphasizes the importance of every single role. So you might have some success, but you won't have ultimate success unless the value of everybody is recognized and appreciated and valued. Um, and then the other side, so you can do it from, so you can do that from a game plan perspective at the whole organization perspective but then also all the little things that you're adding in with handshakes that also comes into the, the picture the handshakes one for me is, is a connection one and, and came uh, way back in when I was playing New Zealand sevens and um, I remember um, I used to be in teams and some guys are naturally get up and they hey how you doing morning some just get up walk and sit down and don't even don't talk to anyone you know and that and obviously that's their own habits so making sure that we connect because and you work it on the basis that we're only as good as our weakest links so we've got to connect our links handshakes is just the way to do it and and it's probably someone asked me now that you're in lockdown and we got social distancing how are they going to manage it i said well easy there's virtual you know you can still do that from a distance it's not mm -hmm. the actual the handshake and the hug is great but the it's it's just a means to connect so as long as we still got social distancing, you know, you can still connect. I mean, in the islands though, we just raise our eyebrows like that, you know, and, and a hug. So you can still keep distancing. The point is make sure you still connect. And um, the, when I was at Connacht, I did a five action handshake. So I got the players to do that because I wanted them to all to understand who we represent. When I came to Bristol, um, I've allowed the boys to add and just, and, and they come up with it as well. So it just becomes something that's special for the group. Just, just on that team spirit and good team spirit, it's clear to see, you know, when I'm lucky enough to go down to the Bears training ground um, to show our sponsors around, after each conversation, you'll get the boys to stand up and sit to, uh, next to someone else. You know, the boys are welcoming whenever you're at the training ground, they give you a fist bump. You speak so much about how important culture is in rugby and also for any organisation. What were the first things you did when you arrived in Bristol? Obviously the handshakes as well, but and how do you get that real team spirit? Okay, the first thing that when I got there, um, it, was, it was relatively easy to get changed because all I did when I went through the meeting is I put up the last 10 years of, of uh, finishing places for Bristol Rugby. So I said, here we go. They finished um, relegated in the championship, da 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 and it didn't look great. And so I just, but I didn't say that. I just put it all there. I said, okay, um, thoughts, just have a discussion, thoughts. And they all came back and said, well, not great. We need to change that. And everyone agreed we need to change. And I said, well, we all know the saying about insanity. So let's, uh, you know, so I just want to make it clear here. I'm not here to change for change's sake. I'm here to change the vision, do things that work and we go through. That's why I had to, because I knew people were already upset because they changed offices, people's offices, because um, the flow was wrong. The, com the complete flow of everything. And when I interviewed everybody, you know, when I, before I was coming and just catching up what they would change, if they were me, what would you keep? What would you change? Everyone talked about the silos, about people working in isolation, the breakdown of communication. 
And the first thing I did when I walked into Clifton's training ground, I walked in there with this is completely the, one of the reasons it doesn't help us is everyone's in the wrong places. So I knew when I asked Mark Tainton before I come, can you just put these changes in place? A few people got their nose out of joint. But when I put that up, they could understand. And I said, I'm going to be, there's going to be further changes as we go through. But again, I rolled out the importance of culture. And, and the thing I talked about culture is I said, we need to build true team culture. And what, what is that? It's, well, I have a simple word for our culture, four-letter word, love. And you, as you can imagine, when I put that up, people go, oh, okay. And the players go, oh, yeah, right. But I said, if you define love, it's sacrificing oneself for the benefit of others. I said, so think about all the people you love. You know, I know I'm sure Mark would do whatever he can to make sure, Rob, that you, you can benefit. And it's the same. And I think that's the, and you'd do the same for your dad as well. And that's the thing is if we, I don't need to bring someone, you know, you can pay thousands and they come and work on culture. I don't need that. You define it, you understand it and you acknowledge it. So I often talk about when players are on the ground and a guy is in trouble and he's a bigger guy and a younger guy, a smaller, lighter guy comes and cleans him out, drops his body down really low. I mean, that's a lot of love. When I see the older guys sharing with the younger guys, helping them, under, you know, um, with their with their game plan and so forth, mate, that's a lot of love is there as well. Um, you know, when someone beats someone in the tackle and then the guy sprints a bit forward to cover his backside, but that's a lot of love. So, again, go back to what I said at the beginning. Just give clarity on what it is and then look for it. Um, people could work for it and acknowledge it and say, awesome, awesome. And I think that's, um, once you put that there as a culture, everything else makes it, why are we doing that? Oh, yeah. We want to build... A really good relationship, really good connection, so that you know that we can um, um, you know um, affect our whole team. So, and it's all geared to getting us to where we need to be because everyone wants to change. Absolutely, Pat. And I mean, one of the things that uh, I wanted to pick up in terms of that whole community spirit is is sort of the attendances that you do get at, at Ashton Gate and especially those on, on a Friday night. I mean, I, I follow Rob on Instagram and it seems like an absolutely cracking atmosphere um, down there. And is that so important? And is that sort of part of the vision that you had when you first came to the club? Because it is a fantastic structure that you've got there. But to have it filled on a, on a Friday night or across the weekend must be really pleasing for you to see now. Yeah, it is. I mean, if we go back to the very beginning, which is uh, the vision, um, when when Steve talked to me about the community. And the biggest thing, if you invest in your community and you really take uh, make a real effort in your community, the community will get behind you as well. And I think the big thing too is that one of the reasons, um, and this is you know, ingrained in me from a young age because you, know, you have pride of where you're from. And in the old day, you would play for your school and at your school, maybe you had your certain colours and maybe we're going to beat everybody that we can and you're really proud for representing your school. And then you go and play for your club and that become a you know, real rivalry. But yeah, this is my club. It's like a, yeah, your, um, you know, your, your army, if you like. And then you play for your province and then you play for your country. You wouldn't dare change. You wouldn't change. If you change, you'd be, you know, it's, it's, it's not good. And then, um, but the problem with professional rugby is that suddenly, and I, and I was in that changeover, is that suddenly um, people are moving all over the place, changing over because it's a job. But the thing is, I remember in those amateur days, we would, you would put your body on the line five, ten minutes to go just to, for, for the cause, for the people you represent, your schoolmates, your clubmates, your, your, your country, you know, all of that. But the problem with uh, when everyone started to move, um, I couldn't say, particularly when I was in Auckland and Canterbury, and Auckland and Canterbury, North and South, Christchurch and Auckland is a real fierce rivalry. Blue, red, blue and white, red and black. And you, you're growing up to hate each other. Well, no, so the Canterbury hate Auckland more because Auckland are like London, if you like. And um, <laughs> basically, they started to come up. Now, I couldn't go back to the old team talks and uh, we, we had blue and white and all that because, mate, they, they, that doesn't, what I could do is connect them to the community to show them who they actually represent. So then you get them into the schools, you get them into the hospitals and you get people and all these kids look up, oh, hey, they go, oh, yeah, how you doing? And all of a sudden, they have a sense of purpose on who they represent. And so when you got teams that I came up to here and Connick is really about making sure that we got people here that aren't all from Bristol, got people who aren't all English all over the world, that we can connect them and to understand, give them history. So we have every week, we have um, 
uh, George Kloska, uh, Blake Boyle and Academy Boys, who are Bristolians, who are in our main group. And um, their job is to give out Bristol facts. It's actually two guys did it last year. Andy Uren and Joyce used to do it and they passed it down to the next guys. So every day got to get up and give up some interesting facts about Bristol. So we're learning about more and more about Bristol, Bristol, Bristol culture. But then we also get getting to know the Bristol people. So then when they're on the bodies on the line, the games on the line, they'll really get, and that's what our people see. They can see the boys giving everything. So they want to get behind the team and get back. And so it's, it's been a really good, um, um, you know, involvement with the community and, and we're getting the benefit and, and obviously we're playing well because the boys want to represent them well and we're getting followed well. Yeah, and, and part of the vision, obviously, part is the results on the pitch and I know you kicked things off this season with, with a home game on a Friday night against Bath, which is always a, a great way to kick things off and you guys got the, re- got the really good start to the season and one thing that struck with me was the interview you did with BT Sport after uh, where you talked about where the club want to go this season and 12 months earlier you said well we want to be Champions Cup and I know you guys just finished just short of that but it wasn't like well no we're going to go for top six again it was the higher ambitions once more and you've talked about a five-year plan so are you on schedule for that at the moment because of how well you've been able to develop since you took over in the championship? Yeah I mean I when I um, it's all very well saying to Steve yep uh, you know, we're going to inspire the community. You have to come up with a plan, you know. So now I know what the vision is. And, and then the other thing I put with that is three three key um, objectives every year for us. And, and that is the Champions Cup I put in there. That's the ambition because everyone's telling me, oh, you've got to get into premiership. You've got to survive and stay in it. It's not the way I work. Um, it's, you know, there's no reason why we can't be the best, the most dominant team in the Northern Hemisphere. There's no reason at all you know, to, to have that sort of ambition. And it's sort of, I can see that. We can do that, all right? But that's uh, there's a lot of work to be done. The second part was about players playing for England because, um, you know, players want to play for the highest level. That's all about our rugby program. If our rugby program is not good enough or strong enough, players won't be playing for England. And the third one, which is our passion, it's about the home ground players. You know, that's our people. That's the... the the academy, the schools, the clubs, trying to bring, making sure they come through. And if they, even if they don't play for Bristol, at least they can come and inspire the community in so many other ways from the values and experiences they get from our great game. So that's all put in, put in place as well. And I think ultimately, um, you know, everything that we've, we've worked together um, is all geared to uh, fit in in those, in those three areas. And, and then when we get to the game, uh, sorry, when we get to the actual game and, and what we're trying to do, um, the targets that we've set for ourselves uh, can, every year goes up and up, um, which is why, you know, ultimately, as I said, relationship performance, I've got to keep everyone accountable. If everyone, people said to me, well, how's Bristol? How are you going to get Bristol to be successful? How are they going to be consistent and be? I said, well, easy. Everyone's got to be better. Everyone, myself included. And we ask two questions all the time. What have we done well? What can we do better? Um, the first one is grow. Um, the first question is reinforcing that we're good. The second one is, is our growth and making sure that we, we, we get better. And, um, and that's the challenge for everybody. You know, at the moment in lockdown, I've asked all staff members as an example, just write down a few things around how you can take, go become world-class. What sort of things you need to do and you need help on and then I've been able to just catch up with staff individually and it's great it's great to see what people have put down but once you write it down <laughs> get to work get to work Matt, no when, you, when you talk about um, the setup it's an organization isn't it it's a big family but it's, a, it's an organization Pep Guardiola talks about when he went when he set up when he went to Barcelona he was probably the worst choice Barcelona could have but he had a vision about how the culture could look and he freely admits he couldn't have done it without cultural architects, is what he talks about. Who, who in the Bristol Bears setup are your cultural architects, the guys who help you deliver that vision? I think the, um, the thing is, when everyone comes into... So when I first came, I rolled that out to everybody that was here, that I inherited. And obviously a lot of people have left from that first year. But once they have that, they've got clarity. And then they can drive it themselves, whether it's heads of departments. So there's a lot of, once I do big picture, there's a lot of little meetings as well. And then people get hold of it and they resonate it. But what I've found is that 
obviously every single person that comes in, whether it's a player or staff, I'll roll out the five-year plan. I'll roll out my philosophy, everything. And then I say, look, this is not, and I'm not asking you to come here. I'm inviting you, you know, but I'd, I'd, I'd hate, I'd just put myself in the same situation. I, I would hate to arrive here. And then suddenly I'm told something that I never knew about. So what I said to you, if you want to come to Bristol Bears, understand first where we are. And I'll say the same thing. I say, what I'm going to say to you, if it's a player, is exactly what I say to my children. All right. When they say, Dad, what, what club should I go to? What university should I go to? Da, da, da. And I said, well, what's your, what's your big dream? You know, what's your philosophy? What's your, your standards and your values? Have a look at all the universities and which is the best one that's aligned for, with you, for you be able to do it. And then you, know, you make the choice. You'll have no problems as long as you do the work. And I say the same thing. I said, so when I do an interview with a player, so I get a, I get a message and saying that from an agent, this player wants to come to the Bears. And I look at and I go, okay, we have a place to see. Sit down, have a talk with them. And then I find out, okay, tell me a bit about you. Ask all the questions. I go, okay, now I'm going to show you what we're about. And I want you to make sure it's aligned. Because if we don't align, if you want to come here for just money, if you want to come here just to play rugby, you've got the wrong team. And they end up signing up for exactly what I did. I signed up for a bigger purpose than just playing games. And then they get here. And so when I'm getting, people are saying to me, oh, the players are awesome. What they do is not because they all saw it and they wanted to be part of it and they've thrown them whole selves into doing it so it's uh, it's fantastic so the architects i would say is um you know uh, pretty much everyone you know because they know what it's about and there's no confusion and then of course you got some the guys who've been here longer drive it a lot more than uh, than the ones who have come in but at least everyone understands what we're trying to do it, it's um just as a just following up on that obviously you mentioned it earlier uh, I'm Rob's dad, and of course, I, I take an active involvement on, on, on his career and, and his choice of university and all that. And um, it was a great disappointment to me when he chose to play full back, but then I realised my broken nose is he should never have played in the back row. It's too pretty for that. <laughs> um, but he, but uh, for looking in from afar, it strikes me the Pat Lamb philosophy. You've, you've uh, adopted completely the Jim Collins good to great thing about get the right people on the bus, which necessitates getting the, rough, the wrong people off it. And then the art is, over time, get the right people in the right seats. Uh, it strikes me that your, the Pat Lamb philosophy is very much about, this is where we're going. If you want to get on the bus, get on the bus. But if you don't, that's fine. But you're not on it. And, and that might be deemed as ruthlessness. But listening to you, it's not, it's not ruthless, it's black or white. Yeah, I mean, I've read a few books and different things, but the biggest thing is life experiences. I think that's the thing. You, you go from your gut, you go from your heart, you go from your feel. You know, like I, I, I often will ask uh, players, um, how do you like to be coached? You know, tell me how you don't like to be coached, you know, and uh, I think, cool. And, um, or I'll ask if I'm interviewing for a coach, I said, how did you like to be coached? And how don't you like to be coached? And I think so many, when I, when I said that I was fortunate to be in some unsuccessful teams, that's because I, you learn from things that, mate, that doesn't work. You know, that's, that's, so I'm not going to be doing that as well. So, and again, I've been, so I always say your life experiences um, are massive as long as you ask the question, what have I done well here? And what could I do better? And when you're asking those questions all the time, because I'm not a massive reader of books. I'm like, in a way, I'll grab bits and pieces and stuff. And there are a couple of books I read all the way through. But there's bits that when I read a book, I, I, I tend to go into, ah, oh, I remember that when I was a young, or I remember that when I was in this team, or I remember that in this situation in my marriage or something like that, you know? And that, so I always bring that into it. But I just go from the heart and the gut that I just know that if I, I put myself in that situation, you know, how that I would I have liked to be treated there? And it goes back to, you know, the best book, you know, the big man's book, which says, <laughs> "Do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you." You know, and it's <laughs> and it's a simple thing too. Is like for me, is like you know, you love the big man and love your neighbour, and you know, and when you do that, it's uh, it's a simple thing. But how do you know how to love your neighbour? Well, you, you got to build a relationship. You got to you know, you got to understand them and understand that. Because I, I say to the guys all the time, self-awareness is a great tool that you should have. 
because I could tell a player, well, you haven't played well today, you did this, this and this, but that's not going to do any good. Or I could ask the player, in relation to your best game, a 10 out of 10, how do you think you played today? And he'll go, oh, it's only a five, and then he'll bring up the issues, and then I can ask the questions, then he takes ownership for it. But the other thing to understand is, I always talk about socially aware. Being socially aware and EQ and so forth is massive. Because I said, and I mean, we only have to look at what's going on in America, but it goes on every day, everywhere around. And I say to the guys, understand that we are all, no one is more important than anyone else, regardless of color, uh, race, um, you know, whether you come from a poor background or a rich background, no one is more important than anyone else. But understanding people are different. And if you have that and you have some empathy that people, um, you know, uh, are different. And But also understanding, hopefully, that I try to get players and people to, un to understand that history, the reason why I love vision, history, your upbringing or whatever, all that's determined is showing you where you've come from and the learnings that you actually, the opportunity to take some learnings, but your vision and your goals and your dreams determine your future and where you could go. Um, and any given time, wherever we're at, wherever we're at, you know, that doesn't mean that whatever you've gone from before is, is exactly what's going to happen to you. So vision is, is really important. So being self-aware and socially aware is, is crucial. But, um, yeah, but Rob, for me, it's, it's really about... Um, you know, what I, what I feel and what I've learnt um, and what I've seen and what I've experienced works. You talk about obviously getting the right people involved and obviously there's some incredible names coming to Bristol uh, pretty soon from your Cal Sinclair's to your semi Radradas. I've seen you talk about when you coach the Barbarians it was seeing Semi kind of putting in the extra work, even on a tour like that, that sort of inspired you to get in contact with him and try and get him involved at Bristol. What sort of things do you look for when you're looking to bring players, staff, you know, coaches into Bristol? Um, so I think from a, from a bigger picture, there's a profile of the team. So I go back to the game that I want to play. Um, and then you're looking at... Um, the, the qualities and obviously you could have all the best players in the world all right but if you don't have a good game you're not going to win it you know and you've seen it whatever sport you're like why they got all these names of players but why aren't they i normally say something's wrong with the game the game plan something's wrong with the culture in their group or something's wrong with the leadership in the group um so being able to build that but remember when i went to connect i arrived at connect and we had the lowest budget in the northern hemisphere professionally and I looked at it and I said um right and people started saying oh this player's no good he can't do this he can't do that and I said okay can I change anything no no that's what you got all right let's start telling me what they can do all right let's start building them up and then and then what I realized then is that we needed to have good staff and staff then have got to have really good clarity on what they need to do to bring everybody up and remember going back to the mental side of it I like to put a player here when I'm looking for staff and then the key is putting as much support in. In my coaching philosophy, it talks about developing the whole athlete, you know, the physical, the mental, and the inner self, who they are, what's important to them, their values, and them as a person. And every bit of our staff has got to be able to be serving to help that player achieve that. Now, ultimately, as I say to players, you know, a lot of people are going to help you. And if you achieve all the goals you want to achieve, well done, you. you've done all the work. If you don't achieve your goals, a lot of people have still helped you and, and put the work around you. Whose fault is it? And they look like this and they go, yeah, mine, just me. Great. No excuses, just yours. All right. So then my job is to get the right staff to support that um, as we come through and uh, the player. Um, and then when I'm looking at individuals and players, and, and obviously when I came to Bristol, um, there's the, um, you know, when you're talking about... Um, the, I just felt a lot of the budget, you look at your budget and your plan, there's a certain amount of players that you do need in certain positions you've got to have. But I, I noticed straight away, a lot of money was spent in the wrong places. There was people getting paid that weren't number one or two. Yeah, a lot of money. And so it was, just a, it was just wasted in the wrong way. So I like to have, you know, the first players should be world-class or close to be world-class. The second ones uh, can compete with them. Then the third and fourth for a younger group that would potentially be number ones or twos, they're going to push these guys because if they're here, got their whippersnapper coming at them, they should go better. And if not, 
the whole team, there's competition right through. So certainly one of the team I inherited, there wasn't enough competition. If we got a few injuries, which we did, we were under a lot of pressure. And so I was like, thankfully, we're in the championship here because I couldn't see how we were going to survive because there's a lot of changes that needed to happen. And when you've got guys who've been earning good money, but suddenly I'm asking them to do more, you know, you've got already a problem there. Um, and then, um, so you're building your team around there. And of course, you need some starters. And when you have the ability to choose like the marquee players, you don't want to waste that. And I believe Pete Clubs and uh, uh, certainly Bristol possibly have wasted that money. So you're asking the question, if I'm going to spend a bit, a bit more money on someone, he has to be a real game changer on and off the field for me. He's got to be someone on the field that makes a difference. So if I take Charles Piertel, obviously he answers that question. But I, the thing is, the only reason I went for Charles is because I, I knew him when he was a kid and I brought him through to Super Rugby. So I knew who he was, knew a lot about him, and I knew that I had a lot of confidence. Rather than looking at his ability on the tape, oh, he looks good. Semi Rodradra, as you said, I saw him playing NRL, fantastic, but I didn't know. So I was just admiring, but I would never have thought of bringing him here. Once they coached in the Barbars, a, got to know him over that week, saw what he did on and off the field, built a relationship. We kept talking through it and conversation, built a relationship, said, hey, he'll be good. He'll be able to come through. So there's a lot of different things, but you're trying to build a, a team that's going to add value, that's going to achieve the goals and get people proud and inspired and then it just keeps going and keeps going. And we're, we're talking about sort of the future there, Pat, but if you don't mind, just going back to sort of the past and in terms of your your playing career and into sort of the coaching you are now, and you sort of mentioned, obviously, Charles coming through and you knowing him through that period. But for you growing up in New Zealand, I mean, we've spoken to Dane Coles recently and, and on Brad Shields as well, and they are just so in awe of how, how much New Zealand has such an impact on people's lives and rugby in particular. What was it like growing up in New Zealand when rugby is such a major part of society? Yeah, without a doubt. You know, look, I, I got my um, self-esteem, my self-worth for the game of rugby because, again, um, although I was born in New Zealand, both my parents are from Samoa. They say Samoa here, uh, but it's uh, Samoa, some more money, some more food. Um, and um, But what happened is... Um, you know, so in those days, in the 70s, there was dawn raids and de deportations and, you know, the Samoans were sort of, my minority obviously were considered factory workers. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, looked on as, uh, you know, positively in some, in some areas. Right. So when you came through and in, in class, there wasn't too many Pacific Islanders with me. So, you know, um, and, you know, so I was pretty shy and, you know, but well, what I found when we went out and played this game, that, um, you know, suddenly everyone wanted me to be in their team. And suddenly, you know, when you do the odd, okay, let's pick teams. I'll let Pat, you know, and you're not never ever the last one picked. And and that was massive because everyone played it in lunch times, you know, and it's, it's, it's changed a lot now because there's so many other interests and things you can do. But in those days when I came through, rugby was, was like church, was like a religion. And um, everyone played it. And if you're good at it, you... Um, you got to go places and certainly that that's what rugby was for me coming through but you know uh, I look at it now it has changed a lot even though it is still the national game it's changed a lot but in those days similar to you talk about the Michael Jordan but you go back to the 70s and 80s it was, it was definitely like a religion in New Zealand. Mm. And I guess with the Super Rugby starting next week camp part as well that that sort of religion and that ferocity of New Zealand derbies is going to be quite exciting to watch and I'm sure like have everyone else to who loves the game, you'll be interested to see how that, that goes. Oh, without a doubt. Just seeing some live rugby again would be awesome. And, uh, you know, New Zealand might go down, I think on the 8th, if they drop down to level one, then the crowds will go back in, which would be awesome because the crowds were dying off a bit. And um, I think it's um, it would be great if they get some good crowds. But the derby games are massive in New Zealand. Like, um, it's um, they're normally uh, tough games. and But we're all interested to see how... How, you know, just to see rugby back, see how, um, you know, following the pandemic and conditioning of players and, and there's some new alterations which are good to the game for that they're going to try. So, no, it's uh, looking forward to it. And you, you kind of mentioned sort of you representing Samoa. Is that, is, is that right to say or Samoa or <laughs> have I got that wrong? Samoa. 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 There we go. Yeah, very good. Very there good. we go. Very good. <laughs> and how important was it for you to, to represent your your nation, if you like, because I know you obviously played that non yeah. non cap game for the All Blacks, but then I guess your decision was vindicated by the fact you had so many fond memories playing for your country. 
Yeah, I mean, the thing for me, when you're growing up in New Zealand, like I was very proud, born in New Zealand and, and, and Samoa, I was very proud to be a Kiwi. And, and I am a very proud Kiwi and I'm also proud of Samoan. You know, you, 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 you're growing up in, a, in the country that you, you're born in, but you, know, you never forget you know, through your family and, and holidays and so forth that who, you know, your, your Samoan heritage. Um, so, but everything in those days was about being an all black when you're growing up. And uh, Samoa wasn't big on the international stage of that thing. And rugby went, um, 87 World Cup, they weren't invited. So it didn't help matters. But certainly coming through 80s, left school in the 90s, I was, I was making my way through the Auckland system. And, um, but the dream was always to be an All Black. And then Samoa qualified for the 91 World Cup. And when I was playing for Auckland, played Samoa, we won. And um, the coach asked me, who I knew, um, they'd, they'd like me to go to the World Cup. And you know, I'm sitting there going, all right, geez. In those days, there was no... Um, eligibility because obviously Samoa wasn't that you could change countries so I said well if I don't get a World Cup I'll never go to one and you know, this will be the last one a big chance you know I was, and um, so we went and it was the massive highlight of my playing career you know what we did when we beat Wales um, we almost beat Australia the eventual winners we lost 9-3 and then we hammered Argentina and then we uh, had gave Scotland a good run in there but it wasn't the fact of what we did on the field is what happened off the field so I go back to the 70s and my upcoming about some, and suddenly it just lifted Samoan people and all around, you know, they just suddenly got the sense of pride. And I was a school teacher at the time. And, you know, all the young Samoan kids are going to be in All Black. Suddenly they say, I'm going to play for the money Samoa, I'm going to play for Samoa. You know, and everyone, it just it just put Samoa on the map in so many ways. And, uh, and that group did a great job. You know, there's was, was a lot of good memories there. Um, and then, but after that, you know, I always had this ambition to be an All Black and I got asked to trial for the All Blacks the next year. I was in the New Zealand Sevens. Um, so I had a trial. Um, I didn't make the team at that stage. Then I got called over to Australia as a replacement. And um, my first game was, I think I'm the only All Black to play that never trained with them. So I came in the night, played the next day. And um, uh, 32 minutes into the game, we were down 7-3 and I, uh, I felt a crack on my ribs. And I thought I'd carry on for a bit more and then I, I couldn't anymore. So I went off and and so that ended up being a few months off. And then um, 93, I got another All Black trial. And, um, but I was playing for the New Zealand Sevens and Scotland and the World Cup Sevens, the first World Cup Sevens. And I did my, my cruise ship. So that was gone. And then 94, Samoa came back and said, it's over to you, but we would like you to be leader and come back and say And I always said, like, I gave this a go. New Zealand's in great place, Samoa. And then I said, oh, if I go back, I'm never going to change. Even though you, you could, I'm not going to change again. I'm going to go to Samoa and help them and put everything into Samoa rugby. And uh, I was really pleased with what we did with Samoa rugby and went to the 95 and 99 World Cup where I retired. Yeah, and it probably involved that as well, perhaps obviously your club career over in, in England as well. Obviously, great memories with Newcastle and European memories with Northampton. Did those, all those experiences that you've achieved help you in terms of your coaching? Did you take a lot of, from, from what you've been able to achieve? Because it is a great list of, of what, what the things you've been able to do in your playing career as well. Yeah, without a doubt. And that was the other benefit of playing for Samoa when we came up here. We beat Ireland and that's where I got invited. Uh, Rob Andrews at the game. I ended up at uh, Newcastle. Um, without a doubt, the different experience, different cultures. When you're growing up in New Zealand, uh, you know, predominantly, they all look up the Northern Hemisphere as, as, as second class, as the best rugby's played down in, in New Zealand. And, and, you know, when you get up here, and I suppose the teacher's side of me is, you know, wherever you go, and you just, more people to meet, there's more things to learn. And I certainly came up here and and yeah, and I realised the game's different. It doesn't make it it means it's it's worse or better. That's it's different. But then from a coaching's perspective, you look you learn you're learning how other people think and, and how people around the game and different ways of doing it. And then you're able to take good bits and pieces from both. Um, and then you you're mixing with different cultures. So all of that without a doubt, you know, and we had a great um team, a more experienced team in with Newcastle, um, where we won the Premiership. And then Northampton with Ian McGeekin was a legend, real mentor. And he, um, uh, what we did with Northampton was was special too. And we we, we were all online. It was, we were supposed to have a 20 year anniversary, obviously, which got cancelled for the pandemic, but everyone was sending messages because they put the game on live, uh, not um, at three o'clock on the Northampton website to celebrate the 20 years. And a lot of emails and photos we're going through and everyone's noticing how old we've all got. 
I was being given <laughs> great memories. That's without a doubt going back to your question has shaped me as a coach. I've got to ask you about that Northampton game as well because I've read that somewhere that you were expecting a child, weren't you? A couple of days or on the day of the final, but it, it happened a few days before. So uh, that must have been a very special week for you. Yeah, it was. So it almost was only going. Yeah, like I, Steph, we we we've always had home births. Um, and uh, she's tough. She's special. And um, so when we felt we caught, when we won the semi and got to the final, it was on the due date of Josiah. And I said to the team because I was the captain. I said, "Look, I want to say it real clear: if he's due around that date, I, I won't be at the game. I'll be at it with my wife and then having the baby." So we had contingency plans, um, and it, it sort of went public in, in the Northampton media. And they were, "Oh, can Mrs. Lamb do the right thing and have the baby early?" I was like, "Do not say that. I got got in a bit of trouble." <laughs> um, but anyway, Josiah arrived. Josiah arrived um, um, on the Wednesday before. And uh, and that was special. And so I had a shoulder injury, which I was lined up for surgery, and I'd been struggling the last the last month of that. And um, and I said I'd play. And uh, so that was my inspiration, really, watching Steph go through that uh, fourth time, no painkillers. And I said, well, I can do this. I'll do this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was great. So every time Josiah has his birthday, I, I know how long ago we won it. <laughs> Um, and you touched on Ian McGee can be a brilliant mentor uh, for, for you, Pat. And just to, you mentioned before your experience at Connacht as well. And it was a club that, as you said, had a really small budget. But I think the term miracle has been used quite a lot about what you guys were able to achieve. And um, how special is that in, in terms of your career? Yeah, that's probably the coaching highlight because when you take a, a group, it just shows, again, the system and that we work uh, works game culture leadership. Um, and I always said to you when I left Connacht, if I go anywhere that has money, I wouldn't change the system. You know, mm. It just means you, you can shop in better places. But certainly the system of gang culture and leadership came through. And it was the ultimate team game because we had to rely on team, not individuals. Um, and, um, yeah, it's a massive, massive highlight there. Um, and, you know, and it's uh, very similar to what we're doing here. And people will always, because we have Steve Lansdowne as our back, will always try and, say that, oh, we're trying to buy this or do that. At the end of the day, we don't have Steve Lansdowne's billions. You know, what we have is the salary cap. It's exactly the same. These other clubs spend more than us. Um, and the, But the model Steve's really impressed with, the model that we're using uh, to achieve his vision and what we want to do is, is the key. That's what we've built extreme trust with Steve and Chris and, and, um, and pre-pandemic was tracking really well. Um, and I believe if the club was the way it used to be, you know, maybe the, we might not have that same sort of backing because, um, you know, uh, Steve's very proud of the way the team is at the moment and the whole the whole organisation and what we're doing in the community. It's exactly what he was looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely, Pat. And just a couple more from, from me before I hand over to Mark for the Mars 15, which is the most important part of this podcast. Um, in terms of the here and now with Bristol, obviously you guys third in the table at the moment, and I guess it's just a, as we've discussed so 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 much on this podcast is we all want rugby to return, and obviously yesterday the Premiership announced that players can start coming back to training, and that must be such a positive thing for for you as a coach and for you as a team because you were doing so so well domestically and in Europe. Yeah, it is, and but we all understand the reason why, and um, I think the key was the incentive, and the boys had trained really well on their own. Um, again, as part of the plan, because the motivation that we have is uh, put to them is that there's only a short window to win trophies. Trophies are sitting there. You know, and normally you've got to come at the start of the season, you've got a long season. But this is going to be very similar to, um, you know, a New Zealand competition, the ITM Cup, because you normally play 10 games, so you're going to have a short amount of games. And every time it's pushed back, I said, instead of looking at it as a negative, oh, we're only going to play this amount of games. Now you look at the prize at the end, it's like, it's like home births. You know, go through all the pain once they arrives. <laughs> there's a mark. Well, we, we can't really say that, Mark, but we just know that at the end there's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, sorry, the wives go through the pain, but, you know, we, we feel their pain. <laughs> um, and just, just before we go on to the 15 as well, Pat, um, obviously the here and now and the near future is obviously with Bristol and you're hoping to achieve what you, what you set out to do when you first stepped in it. 
from the club in the championship. But one thing I've, I've got to mention is there is a Wales fan among us, and I know recently <laughs> you've said um, that that one day you may like to coach coach Wales, and this is all about natural, you know, the natural players that produce is similar to New Zealand. Uh, what do you see in Wales, and why do you think Wayne Pivac's got quite a special opportunity there to achieve something with them? Well, firstly, I want to correct that, and I knew that it would come out that way. And uh, when they, I was talking to a Welsh podcast, uh, yeah. and uh, and I said to the guys, <laughs> "Is that um, you know?" And I made it very clear: I'm not advertising for a job or looking for a job. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that I would love to coach Wales in the sense that, like people say, oh, "I'd love to coach the All Blacks," or oh, "I'd love to coach Bristol," or, "I'd love to coach there," but I meaning in that sense and in, in context. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but the reason being is that. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're talking about the model that I have and what we're trying to do, you know, obviously, if you, when I was at Connacht, the, the level of player wasn't necessarily as good as some of the other teams, but we worked and put it together. The moment you bring better players in, and that's what we're trying to do at Bristol, and then, the, you know, the faster that you can make that happen, the model and the process doesn't change. And it's just, so what I see in Welsh players is very much as, as, as in... Um, you know, generally speaking, as New Zealand players, that there's a lot of um, lot of natural talent in, in playing the game because they play it at a young age and, and good understanding. So then I just think that, that bring that together, you still have to work as a team. You still got to get your culture right. You still could have of talented players, but not but not uh, good people. So you still got to work through all of that. But I just think that there's uh, naturally a lot of what I've found over the times some real talent. Doesn't mean there isn't any in England or anywhere else. I was just uh, certainly that stands out to me. Don't worry, Pat. It's not we're not going to get a news line out of it saying you're going to be the next <laughs> Wales coach. I saw the next day. John Lansdowne asked me. I was like, oh, you ever talk? And we were actually I was on a on a <laughs> in a conference call with Steve Lansdowne and Chris Boy. And I, was, um, oh, I just heard today you you go you want to coach Wales. I said it's out of context, boys. It's out of context. <laughs> and. Um, with the Mars 15 as well, well, Pat, we obviously go through all the different positions, but one of the things that uh, Mark flagged up to us before, before we go into the, 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 the 15 is that you've always said about number eight and been such a tough position to play. And I know about, there's a quote when after a game Nathan Hughes played, uh, that he played really well, but it was all about improving as well. So why is it so difficult to play in that position? And is it brilliant to see Nathan improve and improve and listening to that advice that you've given? Yeah, um, probably number eight's the best position. Uh, because you got a license to do so much in the game, be involved in the game. So to do that, you've got to know the game. And I have a, a, a quote that I use with the players all the time, that good players play the game, but great players know the game. If you know the game, then you can influence the game better. And from number eight, you have a lot of opportunity to do that on attack and defence, but that's if you choose to do it. So if a number eight has low work rate, it's because he's chosen not to be involved. You know, sometimes it's difficult for the wingers uh, as an example, to get involved in the game. doesn't mean they can't, because I put a lot of emphasis, go find the work. Whereas a number eight, the work can actually come to you if you, and you can go and get it easy. So, um, so that was an issue about work rate. And, and that's what my challenge was for, for Nathan and, and for other players as well, is, um, you know, the game has so many opportunities to, 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 to show your, your, your skills and your ability but also the thing that we value the most is your work rate and uh, uh, the things that don't require talent um, because then that's coming back to love again. That's coming back to sacrifice, mm-hmm. coming back to, you know, for the benefit of the team, you know, rather than doing just the flashy things. Don't get me wrong. You can be a sacrifice a lot and do the flashy things for the team. But, you know, I know the general public uh, when they watch games would recognise you know, all the good things that are happening, that's great. But what we do as a team, recognise the unseen work, recognise the, the love. I had, a, I had a flashback to um, an image in my head when you retired, Pat, when you were stood on the sideline, Northampton kit, and you were, you were within shouting distance of your old mate, Dean Ryan. A different, a different number eight. Uh, you were probably more athletic. He was more of the enforcer, I would imagine. Yeah, we balanced each other really well, Dean. Um, when he brought up, brought me up, he was the player coach, and uh, man, he was he was brutal, like as in uh, tough, tough Royal Army, but made good mates with them. Really respect him, um, really good guy. And but the way he did things um, was very much Michael Jordan like, very much. Uh, this is where we go and get it done, and, and um, no prisoners, if you like. 
Um, but um, but I think, um, you know, certainly on the field, there's another guy, Richard Arnold and Pete Walter. We were the back rowers. Uh, we yeah. all had different things. And, and Dean was great. He, you know, like, we talk about the flashy stuff and the unseen stuff. Dean and Rob Andrews said to me, we brought you here to play. You don't have to, there's a lot of guys that just want to hit rucks. So don't worry about hitting too many rucks. The most important thing, get yourself, get your hands on the ball and play. I ended up, I think, a couple of I was top try scorer in the first year and scored a lot of tries because uh, I said, thanks. Okay, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> but we balanced well because Dean would look after that. But yeah, you wouldn't mess with Dean, Dean Ryan on the field. And uh, <laughs> top bloke, top bloke. So we're into the main event now, Pat. Um, okay. and, and one thing I'm going to pose as a question, but I, don't, I think it's a rhetorical question, is I just wonder what, what Pat Lamb, the player, was like to coach. Um, We've heard a lot from Pat Lamb, the coach, but what was yeah. Pat Lamb, the player, like to coach? I would have been a pain in the backside for some guys <laughs> because I, I was very much a why person. I was very, you know, inquisitive. I wanted to know, I was, because I was a big pitcher, I wanted to know. And I caught out a few coaches like this because they bring in drills and stuff. And I said, okay, I'm, in my head, I'm going, okay, I wanted to know how this fits into this. And if they couldn't give me a reason why, I realised he's not really very good, <laughs> you know, he's gone through. Um, and that's why I put a huge emphasis on myself and staff to make sure when you're getting your message across, if you can get the why, not just this is how I want you to do it, this is what I want you to do, give the people the why. If they've got the why, all right, then that motivates them to do the how and the what. Um, so I was very much like that. I loved the game. So uh, I loved being challenged in the game. Ian McGee can challenge me because I remember coming up and, you know, we used to be, I'm on your left, I'm on your right. And he used to always say, deep. when I first came, and he said, I want you in behind. Just tell the guy you're in behind. I said, shouldn't I go on the left? No, let the pl guy in front of you determine where he's going. Then you take the space. And it was a totally new concept to me. And I was going, okay, okay. And then, you know, in my head, I'm going, oh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. And then he starts seeing it in the game and, you know, what he did with the Lions and, and opening up the fences. So very much, uh, I love the game and, and the involvement of the game and how to, you know, it's like chess, all of that stuff. I love that. Um, and then the other thing is that I, I valued coaches that, uh, that were genuine and honest, that would build a relationship, regardless of who I'm selected. I had no time at all for coaches that would be my best mate when I was selected and not even talk to me when I wasn't picked. Yeah. You know, and I realized in time, and that's why, you know, consistency is key. And that's why I love the handshakes and the greetings because regardless, I might've had a tough conversation with a player the night before, but I have to give him the why and this why you're not playing and so forth, could be honest with him. And then the next day he might be really annoyed and walked out of the office, whatever it is. Next morning, give him a hug. How are you doing? You know, because yeah. why? Because that's what I do every morning. So. I'm not suddenly doing it. So relationships are important and for me and, um, and uh, knowing the why. So here's, here's the premise, Pat. Um, Mars have landed. Um, they've challenged us to a game of rugby to decide the future of civilization. So the future of your beloved Long White Cloud Island, um, the future of our lovely rainy country, uh, all at stake through one game. And because it's slightly bonkers, we're going to ask you to pick a 15 of players that you've played with. So we can go back to any era, any time. Uh, over to you. I, I think this will be something to behold, this 15. Uh, I hope so. Um, it's difficult. It was always difficult. But, you know, you play with so many, so it's difficult to narrow it down. But I'll go give it a go. Number one, Lucy Prop, Peter Fatialofa, Peter Fats. Samoan captain for many years. Uh, unfortunately, passed away recently. Um, Legend, but but unbelievable. When you, when you talk about um, so a real enforcer, you know, you piano mover by day, um, and uh, but unbelievable character. He was the one who used to get up in a speech and say, "You can call me Coconut, just make sure you're my friend." Uh, so things <laughs> like that. He was a real humour and he held the team together. But great player, um, led his time and been able to scrum, but also play in the open field. Um, so hooker number two, Sean Fitzpatrick. Um, I came through when I started and he was, he was already established and, but a uh, real competitive winner and, um, you know, very successful, uh, very much uh, in the, in, um, um, demanded high standards um, and led the All Blacks for many years. And, uh, you know, certainly when I came through as an Aucklander, he, um, he was, he had a big influence in the environment there. 
Um, number three, I went for Gary Pagel, uh, oh, Northampton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, big Gary. I mean, we when I played for Newcastle, me and I had a bit of a scrap. I think he stood on my head. And uh, <laughs> But it's it's like like most South Africans, you know, when you're playing them, they're, they're different. It's Chalk and Jekyll and Hyde off the field. Quite a great man. And um, But again, when you want a forward pack, you want people, you want a team that will be fed. Now, teams won't say that they fear. You just know they fear you because you've got some, some strong. So if you've got Martians coming down and they see Fats and they see um, <laughs> they see Gary Pagel, you know, they, they won't take a backward step. Um, second row, I had Robin Brook, a good friend of mine when I came through club rugby, played dual blacks. And again, he probably started that role of a lock six um, yeah. You know, unbelievable. In those days, you know, his, his jumping power, because before the lifting, he could jump. His standing jump was incredible. Um, and uh, But he, he could play in the open. And I, I like my back five, my back five being all athletic. And uh, he, he was certainly one of those. Um, and at number five, I had, uh, you got to win ball in the lineup. And you also got to have a character. So I go for Dotty Ware. You know, Dotty, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dotty, Dotty was an all rounder. You know, obviously, there was, obviously, he would be possibly better players than Dottie in that sense. But when you say, well, okay, what, what do you want? You know, dominate the air. Dottie would win the ball in the air. No problem with his height and his athleticism. But again, you when you've got a Fitzpatrick and a Pagel and, and some serious guys, you've got to have guys that will keep the change room and the culture interesting. And Dottie always did that. Uh, number six, um, man, another, and we're talking about balance earlier in the back row, Tim Rodber at Northampton. Ah. Yeah, another army man, and Tim was uh, was superb. You know, he he was a tough bugger. He was speed. Uh, he could hit, really tackle as well. And I think he complements the two other back rowers that come in nicely. He was tall as well, could win the lineup, could play in the second row. So we had would have good ball from the lineup, but we'd have some good, again, some awesome big hitters. Uh, number seven was a guy, Michael Jones, legend. Um, took the change the whole game back row play. He was a back playing in the, in the forwards body, uh, but he was tough as nails. Um, you know, absolute, uh, um, you know, gentleman on and off the field, but would hit you hard and tackle hard and uh, he never got into any scraps. Um, and, uh, but again, with, with perfect link for the backs that I have. Number eight, couldn't go past Zinzan Brook. I was talking to Zinni the other day when we were talking about last dance and I said, man, that was you. You know, <laughs> Zinni was so yeah. competitive. He wanted to win at everything, but he, he he would get really frustrated, which is why I didn't think he would be good for coaching because he would want it now and he wanted here and you've got to be at this standard or you're useless. Either get up here or you're useless. <laughs> and uh, But again, and another good character off the field. So I went for guys who are really good rugby players, great rugby players, but um, and they but they had that quality that made them winners and Zinni was a winner. You know, yeah, no one yeah. drops a, a drop goal in World Cup semi-final like... Uh, like he did against England, you know, he did it many times in club rugby when we played together as well. Uh, this is in Zambrook. Nine was difficult. Like, I know. Put the other one as the wall. And um, it was between Gary Armstrong uh, and Matt. The yeah. You guys? Hello? You still hear me? Yeah, yeah we got Well, yeah. We got okay. Gary Armstrong and we've got yeah, Gary Armstrong and Matt Dawson couldn't Matt decide Dawson. between the two. Yeah, 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 Ooh. and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Dawes was uh, Dawes was right out there, you know, like he like, like we're seeing in public now. You know, he was a real character, real cheeky bugger. Yeah. Um, in that sense, Gary Armstrong was a cheeky bugger too, but he was tough as nails. Absolutely, like you, you have ice and snow and stuff, and he trained the house down and. I could never understand him, of course, because his, his, uh, his, his, his accent. But we could understand each other really well on the rugby field. And uh, so I've decided that against the Martians, um, you know, Dawes could talk his way through it really well. And uh, Gary would, 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 would just show by action. So I think we probably need more of a Gary Armstrong. And that's why I put, I put uh, Dawes into Waterboy, because he could encourage each other and tell each other and give the plan and, and the tactics. So Matt Dawes and Waterboy, Gary Armstrong starting up. <laughs> Uh, 10 was only one person, Johnny Wilkinson. Um, you know, obviously, Johnny came through as a schoolboy at Newcastle and he came in my second year. Um, we took him under his wing, under our wing, sorry, and um, um, and 
you know, I remember at the time seeing him and uh, seeing him at training. I carried the ball one time and he hit me hard. And I was, whoa, this little schoolboy, he can hit. And, um, <laughs> um, and you could see then, I remember right from the beginning, his uh, commitment and dedication to try and get better. I mean, it was snowing. I remember we were all standing in Newcastle, snow outside, dark. But there was a spotlight, floodlight on, and there's Johnny out there kicking. We are all having our soup and everything, and he just kept going. So I knew that he'd be great. And uh, so he'd be quality. Plus, he could tackle. We need tacklers as well. Um, <laughs> at 12, Frank Bunce. It was uh, a tough between Frank Bunce or Alan Tate. Um, slightly God. different, both uh, slightly different type of players, good men, but I went for Frank Bunce. Uh, he uh, again, an enforcer, uh, great off the field. Um, and so yeah, Frank Bunce there at center. I was hard to, to pick between Samoan legend Toto Vainga, um, who played in that 91 World Cup. He was my right hand man in the team, particularly culture wise. Uh, he was like a chief from uh, in Samoa, so he could do a lot of the discipline for me in that area. Uh, great, great man. But in the end, I went for Inga Tuigamala, another good friend. I put oh, Inga yeah. at centre. Um, again, we need some damage. Right. So, um, you know, he was the original Manutu along here for local Jonah Lomi, which leads me to Jonah Lomi. So I put Jonah yeah. Lomi on one wing. Um, again, the Martians can deal with him. Uh, we all know what, what he was like. Um, and on the other side, a good balance um, is, uh, is a guy, Eric Rush. So yeah. Eric Rush. Uh, Seven's player. Seven's, yeah, 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 yeah. And again, he would bring a lot of humour to the group. And then at fullback, I had a guy, uh, Shane Health, who I came through with oh, yeah. school rugby all the way through. Um, and again, a real competitor. You know, he broke his neck when he was young and came full back from that. So uh, that would be the group. Played for, for, played for Wales as well. Played for he? Wales as well, and he wasn't even Welsh. That's your link, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great again. So, so you, you've got you've got a coach and a and a and a manager, a kit man and a and a water boy next to select. Oh, I'm the coach. I'd love to coach all of these guys. <laughs> you, know, they, you know, to be able to tell them what to do, man, would be awesome. Particularly you know, Dan and, and Fitzy, that would be great. Um, uh, so yeah, and then. Um, uh, kit man would be Junior Paramore. I've got him here, JP. Yeah. Um, no one messes with JP. Gear always comes back. JP would look after that. And more importantly, <laughs> if we got an injury, JP could come in and play anywhere on the field. Matt Dawson as well, water boy. Manager, I hadn't really thought yeah. about the manager. The manager one um, was the only one I had left. Um, actually, I'd probably put, um, I'd probably put, uh, let's see, Ian McGeekin is my, yeah. is my manager. Yeah. Wow, well, that's a setup. Yeah. Yeah, he could he could uh, advise me on uh, on a lot of things, and yeah. uh, and uh, and he'd run the culture really well. One one last thing to select, Pat, and that's your captain of that team. <laughs> All right, <laughs> a few to choose. Um, yeah, plenty to choose. Probably have to go for. Oh, out of all of those. Yeah. Fitzy. Did you get yeah. that? Fitzy. Yeah. 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 Wow. That is a 15. It's a proper team. <laughs> That's a brilliant team, Pat. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask about um, Sean Fitzpatrick as well. Dane Coles has been on the podcast recently and Dane decided to stick him on the wing. Would you ever be tempted <laughs> to put Sean Fitzpatrick out there? They'd probably put him on the wing or myself on the wing. They used to criticise that we'd always score tries out there, but certainly Fitzy was accused of being on the wing. But see, he was ahead of the time. That's why I said we were ahead of our time, mate. There's no point, you know, going somewhere where you know the ball is coming back. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, Pat. Well, Pat, it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to listen to your insights as a coach and have a chat with you this afternoon. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us on the Loosehead Podcast and Association with Talking with the Union. So thanks very much, Pat, for your time. Thanks, guys. Take care, eh? Been a pleasure. Thanks, and many thanks, as always, to Rob, Mark and Dave for, for their time this afternoon. Dave, anything you, you want to add in terms of the website? Because I know the merchandise is flying out the door at the moment. Yeah, just get yourselves over to looseheads.co.uk, uh, enter code pod at checkout for 10% off. Perfect, perfect. Well, many thanks to Rob, Mark and Dave and a special thanks once again to yeah. Pat Lamb for joining us this afternoon. That's been a Loose Heads podcast in association with Talking Rugby Union.